How are you feeling? I feel good. I feel, um, I just ate some ravioli. I'm drinking my non-alcoholic wine. I'm sitting in front of some flowers. I, I'm feeling grateful. I have felt, um, yeah, I'll start with the real answer of how am I doing. Um, you know, almost exactly two years ago, I put out how to not always be working and it's been so beautiful to see the difference of how I feel. Mm -hmm. I think really enacting sort of a lot of the tools that I write about in getting to center. Like I like myself more today. I'm more of service. I believe in my purpose. I don't want to hide when people try to celebrate or congratulate me. I feel, I don't feel grandiose and I'm not telling myself I'm an unlovable fraud today. I'm just sort of right in the center, if you will. I'm just a little bit like on the beam. So um, how are you doing today? Well, that, that's the answer I wanted before I <laughs> went on to read. Because I, yeah, I want to sort of center uh, in where you're at and how you're feeling. And, and you know, take a moment to begin with that because this is a really arduous process and people don't talk about it enough. It's really difficult to put out work. And, um, you know, I just did it. And yeah, you know, I, I honor however you're feeling, but I think that it's such a beautiful reflection to look back at the last two years and consider how much you've achieved and you know we'll get into that a little bit later but do you want to start with reading yeah okay okay so here's getting to center written by me <laughs> forward <laughs> forward by faria um so yeah i just wanted to read a couple paragraphs from the introduction and then i wanted to read a little bit from the chapter on devotion so getting to center emerges from me as a personal offering i am not an anthropologist or a therapist or trained in any type of advice giving this is not an advice book this is the way i do life the ways i find myself over and over again a tornado person's anthology of being it is my way of saying, hello, I've tried a few things now, let me tell you how, and maybe you could ap apply a piece of this to yourself. I am a dancer, first and foremost, an improviser, a studier of choice making and compositional practice. This is my entry point for everything I do. I look at the big picture and ask what is needed, what can be added, what can be removed. What if I did the same thing over and over and over again until it made sense? And what if I let that be okay? In my 32 years on earth, I have begun and ended many things, sometimes on purpose and on my own terms, sometimes on other people's terms. This is a glimpse into what that experience has been like for me. Through the eyes of my queerness, my sobriety, my miraculous time on earth, as with anything I share, it is also through the lens of my privilege, my whiteness and my cisgendered and abled body, a body that holds tangible and emotional pain, a body and a heart and a mind that are learning how to be in the world and grow out of my smallness for the benefit of all of us. May your experience with this book be fruitful. You hate certain parts and may those parts challenge you to develop your own brilliant modalities that suit you perfectly. May the parts that inspire you keep you alive for one more day, keep you hopeful and connected to your body. May your body be healthy and strong and may those barometers be set by you and only you. I see you, I'm with you. I write this to be less alone in my own mind, to connect with you in this vast performance reality, I'm sorry, this vast performance piece that is reality, that is our forever returning to self and center and abundance. In less scarcity and more, there is enough. Let this prayer ring true. I'd also like to note the importance of decentering ourselves in situations where it is more generous to step back, to not have a say, to give space to communities or individuals who are asking for it. To me, getting to our own centers gives us more clarity in how to decenter ourselves, whether that is in conversations pertaining to race, class, privilege, or humanness in any way. 
we must also find the ways where we are not the center. This book is not about becoming the center, but understanding that we are a tiny part in the vast universe where the center lies. That getting to our own center allows us to see our own humanity with humility and grace, making adequate space for ourselves and spaciousness for everyone else. So that's a little part from the old intro. You got any thoughts on that? I have a lot of thoughts on that, but I'll, I'll pause for the devotion part. Okay, I'll read about devotion, then we can have all of our thoughts. So I wanted to read devotion because um, for those of you who may live in the United States or are familiar with the country that is the United States, we have an election that's a week from today. And, um, you know, I have a lot of thoughts. I've been seeing a really great hashtag called hashtag settle for Biden, which honestly, that's my mood. So, um, I, but I've been thinking a lot about, you know, um, how, how small of an act that is for me. Um, it both feels like an important one for me. And I, I just always really think about it for myself. Like I just, I'm not, as I said, I'm not really here to give advice on um, what others should be doing. Uh, but I'm thinking so much about like, what do I want my devotion to my own life and to liberation and justice? What do I want that to look like? after next Tuesday, because I think the focus is a little on next Tuesday, and I think we got a couple days after that to keep going. So I'll read a little bit about devotion. Devotion, prayerful observance and unconditional love. For the self, for a task, for another, devotion is as risky as it gets. To be wholly devoted is to lose part of yourself. As Mary Oliver said, attention, is the beginning of devotion. To be devoted, to be disciplined, we become disciples to ourselves. We become champions of paying attention. It is important to remember that living under the heteronormative white supremacist patriarchy creates so much harm. Our devotion practice is both asking to be dialed up as well as protected from so many forces that are against so many of us, specifically BIPOC and trans communities. So we build practices. We become wholly, wildly, boundlessly devoted to ourselves and to our practices that we have visioned and to the people we love. The whole first chapter is about figuring out what your practice is. If you're like, what am I practicing? You'll figure it out. This devotion radiates out into the rest of the world. And we do this knowing that keeping this devotion is a gamble because the world takes things away or we walk away or something will knock us off our center. What is devotion to you? What does being devoted without losing yourself really look like? I encourage you to meditate on using the word no as saying yes to yourself. I have the word yes tattooed on my right hand and I used to worry people would assume I had a really hard time saying no. Faria has no tattooed on her hand. So we together, we really balance it. Oh, well, um, I worried people would assume I had a really hard time saying no, but this tattoo faces me. It's a reminder to keep saying yes to myself, keep saying yes to being alive, and this often means saying no to other people and to plants. Part of staying devoted to myself is this practice of saying no, placing boundaries, and carving out space for myself to stay devoted to my visions for a practice, to what keeps me in the center. Devotion to community and to our work, to the things we love, devotion to help us endure pain and hardship that surrounds us either right on time or totally unexpectedly. We are called to show up for this. Building a team of others who help you stay accountable, who provide mirrors of seeing yourself, who ask you for your advice and guidance. Community devotion also casts a wide net to those who, might, who you might be of service to your real life communities and your online communities. Usually when I see a topic, a news story, a thread of urgency emerge on social media, I pause. I ask myself what people or organizations in the current community I live in are already doing this work. 
and what can I do to lift up their work, their voices, and possibly give monetarily? If the issue at hand doesn't have a reference point outside of its exact formation, you may want to pay attention to what your collaborators, peers, or other public people you look toward are doing in terms of action. I think I'll stop there. <laughs> I just looked at the next page and in all caps, it just says, you are not a tragic loss to society. So I'll just share. It's a perfect ending. Thank you. Thank you for reading all of that. That was really special. I also want to tell everybody that I wasn't giving Marley the, the finger. I just have no written on my... <laughs> I was like, oh no, what if somebody... Yes, no. Um, oh my God, there was so much that you said that I wanted to bring up. Um, and now I'm like, oh God, where do I go back? Um, not being small. I wanted to start there. Mm. Um, because... I feel like when we talk about, you know, I wrote the foreword and uh, yeah, <laughs> what I did. Um, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, even, even in the foreword, when I talk about this, um, this mirroring that we have with one another, it's really in this, these like minute details, like feeling small is one that I think comes up a lot between us. And I think people that know us or know our work would find it really hard to, to, to believe that we battle with that all the time. Mm -hmm. And putting out work on any level makes you contend with your smallness more than anything because you want so badly, no matter what you tell yourself, you want so badly for people to connect to your work, you know? And that is really ultimately, um, I don't remember what I was watching, but it was something where the person talking, I know this is really vague, I think it was Dave Chappelle actually, talking about, um, you know, um, you know, Dave, Dave Chappelle is, a, is an interesting character in the, in the cultural world right now. But um, he did an interview with David Letterman and he was talking about how like, it becomes a really tricky thing when you make work that is contingent upon being liked. The more people like your work, the more they buy it, the more they read it, you know, it's the, you know, as much as, you know, we've also talked about making anti-capitalist work and what it what the fuck is that even when you're an artist I, I mean these are broad themes that I feel like I'm you know bringing up but I kind of this is sort of the portal that I want to enter with you mm -hmm. um how do you contend with that you know these like dislocating fragmented feelings yeah how do you contend with that your your core is still in so much pain <laughs> just some I light love, topic. I, just a light topic. I love this as an entry point, and it's so yeah, it's interesting. I think one of the last things sentences I just read was about like building a team of people who mirror something back to you. And I mean, I I th both in the book and in my life and on my radio show I talk so much about like the importance of friendship and the important and the importance of like building intimacy for me it's like really about the like platonic partnerships I feel like I really have with people and because as I also said in the intro like I wrote this book to feel less alone I would say most of what I do is in an effort to not feel as alone in my head because I think that's what um that's what can keep me small is thinking I'm the only one who feels small, right? Mm -hmm. So when I mm -hmm. talk to you or other friends who write books um, and they're like, ooh, I'm, I'm really battling this thing or this feeling, it's, I almost always can like snap out of it and be like, oh, okay, like I'm, I'm safe. Like I'm not the only, like the sentence, I'm not the only one feeling this feeling, I would say is what has like, pretty much kept me alive is like as soon as I start to think I'm the only one in an experience that's really lonely and space for me um yeah like a lot of the book and a lot of what I do 
to contend with that is to like build teams around me, whether that's like my recovery communities, my therapist, like psychics I see, like body work, um, and then my and then my friends. And um, you know, I think this is sort of like jumping subjects, but um something that's like in that vein that you that we talk about so much in our friendship and that you just wrote about in your newsletter is like unlovability and desirability and i think that really plays into like that stuff's on on a hundred today like putting a book out having like a pub date i mean talk about capitalism like shout out to everybody on my team who's like here in the group and helping me sell a book but it's like you know we have this day it's like october 27th that's on sale day and of course and anybody has ever looked at you know i think so much about social media and both like propels movements forward in unstoppable powerful ways and completely deplete of like our brain cells and abilities to pay attention to anything and focus. So um, back to how I am, yeah, today was an intense day, you know, and I feel happy saying that to 88 people um, and to just be like, you know, shout out 88, 1988, I was born that year. Um, so great number to have here. Um, I, so yeah, it's like, I'm definitely, because I think also, like, as an addict, there's a little bit of, like, what is enough, right? It's, like, that's something I think, I think we're contending. Thank you for bringing that to us today. Like, I think that's something I've been feeling today that makes me maybe feel embarrassed is, like, if a million people posted about the book, would that be enough? Like, was 50 enough? Is 100 enough? Is 2,000 enough? It's, like, that's really trying to stay detached from numbers, which I think also helps me on a day like today to just be like, you know what, the people I love the most, this is where, I, this is where I'm like, I'm going to cry, 2020, the year of all the crying. It's like the people I really love the most talked to me today, like checked in on me, said they loved me. I'm with my beautiful partner. I'm fed, I'm well fed. I'm wearing a one of my favorite shirts you know I'm just like really trying to um stay in like the simple gratitude list today uh and and the last thing I'll say about this is like and that just keeps me human like I think that's where I want to be um like I feel like our friendship and there's lots of dear friends in this zoom right now who like I would love you if you never wrote another fucking book I would love you if you never you. made anything again. I would think you were the best. I would still sleep in your bed and touch all your books and could talk to you for hours on the phone. And I think that's <laughs> all your color coordinated books. I would touch them, you know? And so I think that's the thing I remember is I feel like most people who I really have deep connections with yes, they're inspired by my work and they're proud of me and our relationships are actually really disconnected from that. And I think that's where social media, capitalism, whatever you want to call it, is kind of hurts that part of us. And today I've really just been like, you hear this in like some 12 step rooms, but today I'm just another bozo on the bus, which I really like. It's like, I'm just another, I'm just another guy today. Like, Yes, I'm an author. I put a book out that I worked really hard on and I'm really proud of. And I'm just like a guy walking down the street, you know? So That's so beautiful, Marley. I love that. Thank you. That was a, that was a wonderful answer. Um, because, you know, yeah, we have such a shared experience with how we put out work and, and also how we consume and think about our own work. And, you know, there's such a layer of doubt in what we do. And, and, and that's something that I feel <laughs> very lucky to be able to share with you because that's part of the loneliness and isolation as well. You know, when you do have an audience and you do feel seen, but you're not being understood. And that's the difference. There's a massive dissonance that's created when someone writes, you know, some shitty review or like, you know, like there's all of those things that actually don't really matter. But um, it does allow you or really force you to confront yourself 
And then ultimately all we have at the end of the day is each other. And we don't really have much beyond that. And yet we're being, you know, it's a struggle. It's a struggle even knowing that because you still want to make work and you still want to have meaning and you still want to help people. I think you're really driven by the need to help people um, because you've had a sort of a miraculous life. You've, you know, you've done, you've done really difficult things. You've been through really difficult experiences. You have struggle with your family, you know, like a lot of our mom shit is rooted in similar stuff, you know, like a lot of that violence um, creates darkness and abstraction in the soul, you know, and, and to see, to see yourself, I think we're always in the pursuit of like trying to see ourselves clearly, trying to see ourselves, trying to see ourselves in the way that we know others see us, you know, and um, I don't know, like, does that sound correct to you? Like you make work to help each other? Like what is the motivation to write? To write? <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about this the other day, thinking about, um, I think I was interviewing my friend Jacqueline Suskin, who also just put out an amazing book. And I think it was in that conversation, I asked her like, why why do we make books? Like, why do we put books out? And of course, I'm thinking a little bit about specifically, I guess, how does it feel to put work out in this time, as we all keep saying? Um, and um, yeah, I think, you know, my sobriety is a, is a through line throughout the book in some ways. I got sober in May of 2011 and quit drinking and haven't drank since. And I feel like, um, you know, nine, almost nine and a half years later, it's something I don't think about a lot. And I think writing for me helps me like remember it, like helps me remember that it was going to kill me and that I was, you know, self medic, but I was self medicating from other things that I think were going to kill me, other thoughts or traumas. Mm -hmm. And so, I had to like relearn how to, you know, self-soothe and, and care for myself. And, you know, that's still happening. I don't think I'll stop uh, working to figure it out, but I think I write, um, wow, I'm thinking of like the simplest answer. I'm like, I write books because I like to, I mean, I like, um, I like writing definitely helps me understand myself. And I think it actually, so, okay, in, before I got sober, I was writing for the, I wrote a monthly column for a website called GR Screamer. That was like a punk Grand Rapids underground website. And I wrote a column every month that was called the art of, and then like everyone was like the art of something. And so it kind of documented actually me getting sober. Um, but I mean, at age nine, I was writing like lengthy poems and like showing my parents and especially my dad, I think was really like, wow, I mean, this is brilliant. Like he was like beautiful mm -hmm. writing. Like I think as a kid I had, and just dancing as a kid, like I'm, I guess I'm thinking of like people clapping, like uh, growing up as a dancer and like, I was really lucky to like dance with a ballet company where I like performed in front of thousands of people from a very young age. And so I think from a young age, I had an example that was like, if you share your art, people will clap for you. People will cry and weep if you dance. Um, and so I think I've just kept doing that. I mean, that's where I'm like, wow, yeah, my career has spanned actually a much longer time than I even realized sometimes. And so I think um, dance and performance really showed me that like really physical clapping that like people are like wow that was still moving and so I think I just have even though sometimes I don't like myself or believe in myself there's still some sort of proof that keeps happening where I keep either mm. dancing or writing mm. and people keep being like thank you and I keep being like all right and to me it's such a god channeled 
situation. It really has very fucking little to do with me. Like there, when I was reading the audiobook, I was literally reading parts of it and I was like, this is brilliant. Who wrote this? And I was like, could have only been me. I'm the only one who had access to the Google Doc. Um, and sure. so, yeah, that's where it feels like I also write books because God told me to write books and I don't fight with them, him, she, whatever their name is. Um, G-O-D, clouds, universe, you get to make it up in the book. Um, so yeah, that's why I write books. God told me to and I don't fuck with God. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Next. Uh, Wait, whoa. actually, can okay. I ask you a question? Can I ask you yeah. a question? Ask me a question. Because we're yeah. in conversation. I actually have a question for you. Um, it's sort of twofold, but it'll probably take us into questions. Um, so I'm thinking about your novel that you just put out about a month ago, and I'm going to botch the exact dedication, but I believe you dedicated it to survivors. It's, it was like, this is for survivors. And it's been out for about a month. So I want to hear a little bit about like, why do you write books? Or who do you write them for? Um, especially a book that you worked on for like 18 years. And we know we, t we talked in our friendship closer to when it came out. And I got to see you at, uh, see you in, a, in your own digital event. And... So yeah, I guess like, and so how does it feel to be a month away from being really vulnerable and putting work out? And why do you write books? Thank you for asking that. It's such a generous thing to do at your own rating, uh, <laughs> your own event. Um, but I mean, it's true. Like we, I think I gain so much from you in our lengthy conversations that we have every couple of months. And um you know, I'm, I'm famously drained by people's energy, but when you came and stayed with me in January, it was just like a golden touch, you know? I, I, I do feel so seen by you and so understood by you more than anything. Um, you take great care in trying to aid me. And that's such a gift. I feel very honored by our friendship. Um, yeah, so I wrote a book that I wrote <laughs> for 18 years, as you said, and it is dedicated to survivors and, okay, I mean, yes, also can't fuck with God, G-O-D, love you, uh, huge, huge fan. <laughs> and, <laughs> Um, but there, I mean, I think that there, not to sound too like floaty or, you know, but there is an act of the divine in what we do, you know, like, um, I'm not, I'm not pretending to be anything, but I, I do, I do understand that this is bigger than me. And this is just outside of me, actually. And there is an invisible hand that comes through me. And I can't tell you, I don't even understand how I wrote a book for 18 years. Like, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I don't have a, I don't, I still don't have like a fast and easy answer. I have many theories. Um, and I think the main, the main reason is that I never read a survivor's story really before. I've read about rape. I know that narrative very well. I know that it's a narrative device but I don't think that we have enough out there, which is similar to your work and what it provides and what it offers. What do you do next? What, do, what happens to you after the violence meets your body? What happens to your soul? You know, what happens to your mind when it's collapsing? Those are the things that I am like really, really intrigued by. And ever since I was a kid, I've needed to understand because I was I was born of violence, you know, I was, I was raised in a very, very violent home life. And I'm still many, many years later, I haven't, I haven't gotten out of it as much as I, I'm no longer in physical um, uh, proximity to the violence. It's still there. It's still in my body. It's still in my bones. It's still in my blood and it reverberates through me. And the only thing that makes it feel okay or satiate that feeling is being able to write about it. 
and to understand it through words and to, to sort of grasp it through my own. There are things that I have no idea that I'm about to, you know, figure out while I'm writing. And I'm sure, you know, with you too, there's like a sense of just like, you're, you're getting a signal and you're like, oh yes. And then you're deciphering it, you know? And, and that's the process of writing. You're deciphering these codes, you know? Um, so I'm just out here deciphering these codes and I'm just trying to understand, you know, why I went through the stuff that I went through and how can that help me be a reflector and a light and a mirror for other people that are going through things. Yay. All right, shall we move but to I our really, question? Oh, go ahead. I want to, I just last, no, but I mean, there's so much I want to talk to you. I'm so mad that I only got like, 20 minutes. Yes, we can go to the questions. But what you said about the election, really, I think I want to end on mm. that with like, what really, really, I think, brought us closer together this year was our commitment duration and our commitment to getting better as, as thinkers and comrades and people that are invested in the betterment of the society in this in this world and our species so i think that i'm with you like i'm not really thinking i'm i can't even vote i'm not american but um so you know that's one other thing but like i i'm really thinking about like okay well what's next what's after the election it's a shit show no matter who wins so you know Let's, let's just, for, let's not forget that we have a lot of work to do to make this society better. And I'll end it there. And I think, I think that was sort of like my, and this is in the book, it's like I talk and think a lot about like pacing ourselves. And for me, it was like, I knew I was going to put a book out a week before the election. So I, what I let, what I call in the book, I pre-paced myself a couple weeks ago, I felt hand sewed a Biden Harris sweatshirt. I like raffled a quilt and donated over $4,500 to end voter suppression in marginalized mm. communities. I was like, let's fucking go. I'm a tech spank. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna like make sure I do it all. And then this week's about the book because the book is choose your own adventure. If you're tired as fuck from 2020, the book is like, don't do anything then. Like, go rest. Mm -hmm. Like, I would imagine, you know, it just exhaustion that I maybe w can't understand as a white person or that, like, in certain identities, some people just, I would imagine, have had easier years than other people. I know, and there's, like, we talk so much about identity politics and both, like, how they're <laughs> sort of weird sometimes and helpful and, like, I know plenty of people who had, who regardless of their privilege, had emotionally devastating years personally that maybe need a break. Like, I think there's so many reasons to need a break. And so that's where I hope people just pace themselves. Like, it's in a week. It's going to be a really intense day either way. So just being honest with yourself, like, do you have energy? Get on the phone. Like, call some people. Make sure your neighbors are voting. Are you really tired? maybe take a break. Like maybe don't look at the TV or something. I just think that's where like, I want people to be honest with themselves. And that's like literally the point of the book is like, be honest with yourself. Like, what do you have room for? What do you have space for? Get to work or get to rest. Do one. Um, right. But, but figure, uh, figure it out. And it's the long game. It's the understanding that this isn't, this is, this is a very long fight. And you know, what we saw in the summer with, you know, protests and, and, and fighting for Black lives, I think that was, that was, there was a momentum there that I missed, you know, yeah. and there was a momentum there that I feel like we just have to remember that that's what we're fighting for at the end of the day. Yeah, um, Nika's here. I'm guessing she wants us to get to these questions. I will just say, yes, it's like it's a week before the election in West Philly yesterday. The police murdered a black man with mental health issues in front of his family. Like that, and that's going to happen on Wednesday next week, too, probably, right? It's like we're not finished on Tuesday, people. <laughs> There's just so much to do. So fill in your goddamn bubble and then 
continue on with the tools in the book and what your friends are telling you to do. Okay. Shall we get to questions? Okay, questions. Yes, let's, like, maybe there'll be questions about this. Okay, so I'm supposed to do this. Okay, great. Uh, from Shelby H, how specifically do you persevere doubt as a writer? I just decided finally to apply for my MFA, but I go through waves of doubt and assuredness every day. Um, I'm going to sort of like spitfire these questions since there's sort of a lot or a couple, but, yeah. um, yeah, you got, I always say to people, I, this remind, yeah, I do have them from me. Um, this reminds me for you of what you asked at the beginning or what you said about, like, I think people are surprised when they find out we might be having a hard time putting out work because we sure as hell know how to make our social media look like we're just wearing our outfits and talking about our books. Like it's no problem. And so what I tell people is like, I go through, I also go through waves of doubt and, and lack of assuredness. And I just do it anyways. I think that's a little bit of the, like, it feels like a calling from my higher power to do this work. So I do it. And I don't argue with that higher power. I just keep doing it. Um, I mean, I try to argue with it, but that's where I'm like, you don't have to wait to feel courageous enough to share your work. You just do it anyways. So yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Why don't, why don't I just, I can just read these. Is it that yeah, just go. yeah, I don't, yeah, mind. Yeah. I don't mind. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how do you both rest? Baths? That's it. I take baths. Is yeah. I, I don't know how to rest. I'm a Capricorn. <laughs> Shit, I'm trying to Capricorn it sun and I'm a Capricorn moon and it's really hard for us to not work. I did write a different book for that, but I don't remember what it said. So, um, I try to do that. Yeah. I, I also like, um, I really like games. Like I like to play like Farkle, which is a dice game. And my partner just got us categories, which is a fun game. So I try to do like games. Okay. What's your go-to technique when you're really off center and need to return to yourself? Um, that's a beautiful question. And I'm a little bit like, go to booksormagic.com or whatever the website is and get this book. Um, I would say my go, my go-to, which I also can't take credit for remembering on my own. I feel like this is a little bit of like my partner has really been reminding me this is dancing. So dancing is my mm. like, go to fastest technique to like get back here. Mm. Can you speak to practicing, maybe this is a little more for you, uh, could you speak to practicing forgiveness, especially in the face of trauma slash? Mm. Uh, okay. Um, okay, I, I feel like you should answer the questions that are to you though. I'm okay, like, okay, I'm going well, to a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, could you speak to practicing forget? Uh, I mean, sometimes it takes a while. I think it's so, it feels so, per forgiveness feels so personal to me. Um, I will say, I think this is a little bit of a hot take that is maybe a little different from trauma and abuse and more kind of in the harm category because I think I hope that as a collective, we're starting to get a little bit clearer about those things. Um, really looking forward to Adrian Marie Brown's new book about cancel culture. Um, uh, kind of, yeah, looking at the difference of like someone pissing you off and harm and trauma and abuse, I believe are different things. But um, mm. something I've been thinking about is like, uh, there's sort of like a phrase in 12 step rooms that having a resentment is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. And so, yeah. um, and again, like I'm, I think that's maybe different than someone who is like abusing you, but I just know that like, I also saw a meme the other day, which I could remember who made it. That was like, you can forgive someone and not reform a relationship with them. And that's some, I've been thinking about someone who like, coerced and manipulated me in an intimate situation a couple years ago and I 
don't want to feel that resentment anymore. And so I can actually forgive that person in some of my own ways and we don't actually have to speak at all. And so I think it's like, you don't have to actually come into contact with your abuser or someone who's caused trauma for you to sort of like forgive the energy of the situation so that you can move on. And what I will say is that space for me personally is so important because I can't do it when I'm still in contact. It, it, it hurts too much. And I feel like that feeling like becomes bitter or something. And I need a lot of space to process my emotions. And I don't think we get that enough. So I would say space number one, for sure. I love that. We have two questions about capitalism. Uh, Elizabeth asks, our current economic system requires us to pay for certain necessities. And so I was wondering, how do you write what you think in a capitalist society? And how do you balance the need to provide for yourself and the need to be able to write with intention? Um, That's a great question. The other person says, do you, Lynette, do you have any guiding principles or paths you follow toward creating anti-capitalist art slash work? I want to just leave Elizabeth's up for a second and look at the wording again. Um, So, you know, I don't really, it's funny, I had just posted recently that Bust Magazine called my point of view anti-capitalist. I don't really necessarily identify, I mean, I guess I, you know, it's one of those things, it's like, this is bad, it's like when you hear Dolly Parton be like, I'm not a feminist, but in your head you're like, yes, you fucking are, Uh like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Um, I feel like that, like, I'm like, I don't identify as an anti-capitalist, but, like, clearly I am. I, I mean, I do, so, yeah, I'm a person who, like, makes money in a capitalist world. Like, I don't think, I, I'm obviously not a capitalist, but I, I'm really excited about this question because I really feel like it's in the book. There's, like, a whole part in the book that, for me, is about generosity, redistributing wealth, and resources, and energy, and for me, I really have to shout out my friend Sarah Godestiner, who writes and talks a lot about money magic and is um, a white Jewish queer woman who just writes a lot about like when I like when I the more I give the more I make which again is yeah Mm -hmm. and I think that's coming from a place of privilege I think I'm absolutely in a place of privilege in terms of like how much money I make at this point in my life and my career Uh, I'm not rich, I don't have savings, but I'm comfortable, and I have made, I will absolutely say, and I feel like this goes back to, like, me and Faria and other friends this year really being, having a lot of conversations about, like, what are we committed to, how do we move forward, and I have donated or raised or given probably tens of thousands of dollars this year. And that meant I made more money also. Like it's, it's both ways. Like it's not just the more I make, the more I can give. It's like the more generous I am, I see that, that coming back through in my business. And so that's sort of part of it is like, I try to really consider how, yeah, I spent probably 50 to 100 hours making the quilt that I raffled off. It's like, I really think about like, literally stitching and rearranging my time and energy to be of service so that I can can do also have the time to write and share in that way. I hope that sort of makes sense. Um, yeah, I think my guiding principles that I follow are just like generosity and redistribution and I'm not perfect at that. I am, I would say I'm newish at that. Um, and I have found that my community is stronger. My friendships are stronger, um, because of that mindset. Faria writes a lot about anti-capitalism. Subscribe to her newsletter and pay her $10 a month. Thank you. (laughs) That's also in the book. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. I will quickly say that, like, it, it is a string about it all the time. You know, making art in the time of capitalism is really, really tricky because you have to have, you know, neither of us come from money. So that's like a, just right off the bat, it's like we have no safety unit. 
I can't go and get money from somewhere else. I have to make money off of my art. So that creates a really difficult bind where you mm -hmm. are constantly uh, feeling as if you, you, you have to keep going. You can't rest. I mean, that's for me. Like, what am I going to do? Like, I don't have a savings account, you know, X, Y, and Z. So I feel like I'm always running on steam. But the more generous I be, the more I think about redistribution, the more I, th the less I think about myself and trust that the universe is going to provide for me, the more I just feel like things just fall into place. And that's being anti-capitalist, yeah. trusting, I trusting in abundance. How are we doing? Do we have one, one other question or? There's a how? bunch of, there's three more okay. questions. I think we can do them quick. Um, I'll also say that um, someone named Jackie Berry, who may or not be my significant other in the chat said, you should read your gay ballet poem. And just so for anyone watching, I want to point out that poem is actually not in the book, but I do discuss it. Um, I did recently find a poem that I wrote when I was 16 years old about not being a dyke, but wanting to get in a fellow ballerina's pants. So it's a really great story. It's in the book. You don't want to miss it. Spoiler alert. I did turn out to be a dyke in the end, actually, um, even though in the poem yeah. I claim definitely not. <laughs> Death, not. Um, there were accusations that I was the ballet lesbian. And so that's why I was closeted for 15 more years. But it's gonna be okay all right Ginny says I keep oh this is cute I keep I said cute this is not cute this is serious I keep hearing people recommend making a special self-care plan for after the election are either of you doing this and if so do you mind sharing slash have any tips I think this for me is a little bit of choose your own adventure what where's your energy at like I'm a little bit like I, yes, I'm a, I'm a gay person and my, like, my partnership, like, when we walk down the street, it's pretty clear we're gay, um, and I live in a, I live in a small town that's very queer, like, I, I don't really have a lot of my own safety that's threatened, um, in the current political structure, and so for me, maybe I'm speaking to, to like, flippantly or strongly that I'm like I think I just am gonna kind of keep working on stuff like I'm I'm just not of a space that I think like I think it'll be really really sad if the current president wins and I think it'll kind of push me to just get to like I just I have energy right now I'm like really I have been taking care of myself so intensely for the last few months I have my home I have my partnership I have my dog like I really feel like I have my tools right now. And so for me, I'm, I might be thinking about who will I need to be of service to and caring for, because mm. I know, you know, I was just talk like in my small town, you know, I, there's only a few people of color. And I was just like, you know, I was just on a walk with my friend who's a non-binary black queer person. And you know, who lives in my pretty small, predominantly white town. And I would imagine that like one way or another, like those are my neighbors that I'm gonna wanna have energy for next week. So my sort of, I'm gonna take probably some great baths and probably not watch the news to take care for my, myself so that I can actually be available to some of my like neighbors and friends who actually might be a little more scared and like literally in danger, so. Okay. What advice do you have for finding your direction and purpose? Again, I'm like, read all of our books. They will teach you. Um, yeah, I think literally read the book, but I, I think purpose really comes through like list making. I've been thinking about list making and praying and there's a lot of this in the book. Um, how do you navigate being multi hyphenate artists? Um, 
So actually I have a really clear answer for this. I used to be, feel like I was quote all over the place. I'm like, oh no, like I'm a, I have a dance degree, but I write books and teach online classes and have my newsletter and my Instagram and like make quilts and what, who am I? And then I actually was able to sort of um, narrow in and I sort of read this at the beginning, like I'm a dancer first and foremost, and I'm an improviser. Like I'm trained in improvisation as a compositional choice making technique. And that's actually what I do. It just looks a bunch of different ways. Um, Bria, do you have any thoughts? I like that. Um, I never want to be contained. You know, yeah. I never, yeah. I never want to be one thing. And I refuse to let anyone do that to me. So I, you know, I also feel like a jack of all trades all the time. Um, but then I, yeah, I've started looking at, uh, looking at that with more love and affection because I get to do whatever I want to do. And that's brilliant. Why not be free? So funny because my answer was the classic fake it till you make it, where I was like, I think I believe this. And I really needed to hear what you had to say. I was like, okay, yeah. Because there, of course, there's part of me sometimes, it's like, I wish I was just an author who just only did that. Nah, babe, like, that's nah. That's just boring. Yeah, okay. that's just boring. You wouldn't, yeah, you're a Gemini. You don't want to, you don't want I, that shit. I can't. There's no, I couldn't. There's no way. Couldn't have tried. Yeah. Couldn't have yeah. tried. Okay, two quick ones what does a great bath entail just as a point of reference truly hope this isn't weird so funny we had a jackie and i had our friend kaya visiting us recently uh who's an amazing interviewer of artists and i made her a bath which also speak of like platonic wow. romance like it felt really hot to be like wow this like beautiful woman is in our home and i'm gonna like make her this lavish bath so i like made her a bath with like, I picked just the right flower essences to put in, lit all the candles, made sure she had a LaCroix, Jackie made her a coffee, like, um, yeah, lit the candles, put, I, I gave her a book, to, like I curated which book I thought she would like to read. It was really, run a bath for your friends. It's like really mm. sensual, intimate. I'm like, I'm getting on a plane, baby. I'm coming to Brooklyn, I'm gonna run you a bath. Um, uh, and also, like, when my body just really hurts, I'm just, I just dump Epsom salt in there. That's, like, mm. like also. Um, mm. Really quick, because this is, like, just a straight-up brag, um, but my bathtub in my home, my beautiful, talented lesbian landlords drove to Taos to get this bathtub, and it was owned by this openly bisexual woman in the like 20s and 30s named Mabel Dodge Lujan and her bathtub was like in her hosting residency space in Taos where she hosted multiple people but the two that took a literal bath in the bathtub I soak in would be Martha Graham the grandmother of modern dance and Georgia O'Keefe herself um and some others, but it's like a really haunted magical bathtub that they literally got and like drove to Madrid, New Mexico and put up in this thing. And there's also some, there's some like death and darkness energy in the bathtub. It's like, like I said, it's definitely haunted, but um, mm. like some of the greats bathed in this tub. I can't there. wait to come. Oh my God. Oh my God. <sighs> okay, last one. Last How question. do you say this is for you. I'm just kidding. Or it's for everybody. <laughs> How do you say no to the people in your life who you love most, family, who are boundaryless, especially during quarantine? Um, you understand why it is that you need to say no to them. And then you gain power from that truth. Does that make sense? I love that. Yeah, I think absolutely. I think clarity around the no. Um, I think for me, it's also like, how do you say no? Like, this is a very kind of like co co codependent Al-Anon 12 step answer, but it's like, um, I really keep the focus on me in terms of the how, like, instead of like, you're fucked up, so I can't hang out with you or it's it's just kind of like, I, here are my needs, 
So I'm going to take care exactly. of my side of the street. And exactly. those are what they are. Like, and exactly. they're not um, open to interpretation or negotiating. Um, so I yeah. think that's, that's kind of the like, just really keep it about you, your needs, what your side of the street is, and let them know that that it's not up, it's not like open for a conversation, so. Yeah. There's no negotiation to the space that you need. People will tell you that knows. there is, but uh, there is no negotiation. Okay. That's a perfect place to end. There's no negotiation. Okay. Yeah. So, um, well, you did, you did it. You did your event. We that was great. Honestly, I had a great time. I always forget. I always like get so nervous and think about it all day. And then I'm like, I live for this. I live for the in conversation. That's what I was born yeah. to do.